Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our annual Leventus Lecture, um, our, uh, our Center for African Studies um, annual event. It's a very great pleasure for me to welcome you here and to introduce our fellow uh, for this year, who's been here for the past term. We have, a, uh, we have two Leventus Fellows who join us every year, and our lecture this evening will be by Salahu Mustafa, who joins us um, from Amudo Bello University. Salafu completed his first degree at Bayero University in Kano, and uh, he completed, I'm very happy to say, he completed his PhD in South Africa at the University of Zululand. Um, and he'll be speaking to us this evening um, on the collapse of industries in northern Nigeria in the 21st century. This is, of course, a topic that's very um, uh, close to all of us, it's all those of us on the African continent, have witnessed the collapse of domestic economies as a consequence of neoliberal economy, neoliberal policies uh, and structural adjustment programs ever since the 1980s, uh, affected much of the continent, southern, east and west Africa. Um, and Salafu will be speaking to us today about um, his particular case study in northern Nigeria. Thank you very much, Alu. We, we're very happy to hear your lecture and welcome again, um, just as you are about to leave us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening. I would like to first and foremost to thank the Levent, AG Leventis Selection Committee for finding us worthy for this award. I will thank you very much for that. And I also, also like to thank Professor Morilas, who has been here since my arrival, and we've been discussing about the topic. Uh, the topic of my research, or the paper I will be presenting the title, is a factor underlying the collapse of industries in Northern Nigeria and its impact on society and economy since 1999. And the paper is divided into three parts. Part one deals with its introduction. Then part two deals with factors responsible for the collapse of industries. And the third uh, part of the paper, the impact of the collapse of industries on the economy and society of Northern Nigeria. Uh, for, the, for this paper, we need to have a background of what is Northern Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is one of the largest countries in Africa with roughly uh, or as uh, estimated population of 2 million and 16, I mean, 216 million as at 15 November 2000, 2022, when the world population reached 8 billion. So the population of Nigeria now is put as 2 million, I mean, 216 million population we have. Uh, we look at the factors responsible for the collapse of industries. We have various factors. Number one, we said there is inadequate power supply, high rate of importation of foreign goods, imposition of different forms of taxation and levies. Number three, structural adjustment program which introduced by Babangida administration, military administration in 1986. Then lack of proper implementation of national development plans and industrial development policies and strategies. Then the impact of the collapse of industries include insecurity, loss of jobs and conclusion. Then the factors responsible for the establishment of industries or in Northern Nigeria. There must be a factor or reason for which an industry can be located in a particular area. Even though the other part of Nigeria, especially the Southern part of Nigeria 
had their industries earlier because industries were first established in the southern parts of the country. We shall discuss, we'll be discussing the reason why. Then much later, the industries were established in northern Nigeria. So we we'll look at the reasons for the establishment of industries in northern Nigeria. Number one, the population. If we look at the population of Nigeria, over 60 to 70 percent are in the northern part of the country. If we look at the land mass, over 70 to 80 percent of the total land mass of Nigeria is in the northern part of the country. Then the raw materials, because for one to establish or to site an industry in a particular area, it needs a raw materials which can be used to feed the industries. So there are a lot of raw materials, such as granules, cotton, hide and skin, and other abundance raw materials, mainly derived from agriculture, because Northern Nigeria is the food basket of Nigeria. And then there were financial incentive provided by the then original government which led by former premier of Northern Nigeria, Sir Ahmadi Bello, the Sardona of Sokoto. Uh, the establishment of industries in Northern Nigeria took place in Persis. The early ones, the first industries established in Northern Nigeria were in small, a medium size, employing 10 to 10 people. By 1957, there were 29 such industries in Northern state, of which Kano, uh, of which 20 were in Kano, three in Zaria and Jos, and 10 in Kaduna. Then the large industries with large capacity was established also in 1970s, 1957, sorry. And they are, or they were, United Nigerian Textile Kaduna, the Nigerian Tobacco Company located in Zaria, which later uh, metamorphosed to become British American Tobacco Company. And the last one, Nigerian Bottling Company, Kano. So, here we are, we are going to look at the factors why those industries collapse. Because between 1957 to 1970s, industries in Northern Nigeria enjoyed a tremendous prosperity. In fact, a large community migrated from other areas and comes to settle in the industrial areas of Northern Nigeria. And those areas are Kano. In Kano, you find uh, Bompai, Sharata, and other, and other parts of Kano. Then in Kaduna, you find industries, a number of them in Kakuri, Jos, Plateau State, Kaduna, I mean Zaria, Kaduna State, Ajakuta, Kogi State, and so many other parts of Northern Nigeria. There were a number of those industries which enjoyed government support between the period I mentioned earlier. But from 1999, there was a transition from a military regime to a democratically elected government in 1999. 99. So from 1999, the number of industries in Nigeria began to decline drastically. One of the factors was inadequate power supply. Nigeria had the capacity of generating more than enough power for the country, which can be dried from gas and other sources. But unfortunately, the corrupt leaders 
we had from the period to now, siphon and stole the money to the extent that in 19, from, from 1999 to 2014, over 16 billion US dollars were spent in the name of repairing our power sector. But yet, there was nothing to write home about it. And most of the uh, energy generating plant we have, they are located in Kainji, uh, 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 Jaba, Sharoro, in present Niger, Niger states. You could see, based on my finding, the start capacity of current uh, energy generation in Nigeria supposed to be 7,876 megawatts. But the install, uh, installed capacity available now is less than 4,000 megawatts. Even the 4,000 megawatts, I think in this year, 2022, there were about three or four times collapse of the national grid, total uh, blackout. So how can industry be survive in th such uh, circumstances or situation? I was able to highlight some of the problems associating with the power generation in Nigeria. The following, uh, the following are the challenges to power supply. Number one, inadequate and delayed maintenance of facilities. Number two, insufficient funding of power stations. Even if the government provided the fund, the government official youth misappropriate and misuse the fund for other selfish interests. Then the obsolete equipment and safety facilities and operational vehicles are also major problem. Then inadequate and obsolete communication equipment, then low morale of staff in the sector. Anybody who was working there will tell you what he earns a salary or whatever was discouraging. Before the NEFA privatized and changed the name from NEFA to PHCN, Power Holding Company, in an attempt to restructure, to reorganize the, the, the sector. But yet, there was no positive result. Another factor that led to the collapse of industries, not in Northern Nigeria alone, in Nigeria in general, there was a high volume of importation of foreign goods and services, which it became difficult for locally produced goods and services to compete with that of uh, the foreign one. For example, China. China is one of the major importer of goods, especially cloth and other materials to Nigeria. So our local industries cannot compete with that of China. The other factor, imposition of different forms of heavy taxations and levies. Here I must make it clear to you, we are not saying industrialists should not pay tax. Yes, we are not saying, but from the interviews I conducted with the industrialists, we discovered that there were a number or a lot of duplications of such tax. If you is if you establish, no matter how small, even if it is a small or a medium industries, you will be battling with nearly twenty different agencies seeking to collect tax from you, from the ones owned by the federal government and the other one owned by the state and local government. At the top, we have federal uh, revenue. Under federal area revenue, 
there are other agencies who are collecting taxes from industrialists, which makes it difficult for industrialists to what to operate the industries because they will be operating at loss. Uh, another factor is structural adjustment program, SAP. It was a policy which was introduced by the then military head of state, General Ibrahim Badamasi Baba Ngida in 1986. Even though there was an attempt to introduce or to adopt the policy under Buhari, the current head of the president, when he was then head of state, but they were not succeeded in introducing the sub until when Babangida came into power. And the policy was introduced and accepted in 1986. And the whole idea of the structural adjustment program, it was a condition given by the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, London Club, Paris Clubs, and what have you, for Nigeria to be given loan. One of the <clears throat> conditions given to Nigerian government then, devaluation of currency. The country's currency must be devalued. The, po the purchasing power has to come down, number one. Number two, there were subsidies given to industrialists, especially if they are if they were importing a new equipment into the country, there were what we call import duties free for those industrialists. But based on this policy, uh, government, I mean, uh, IMF forced government to withdraw all those subsidies, which seriously affected our local industries. I listing many uh, uh, impact of uh, uh, SAP. Then another factor, lack of patronage of locally produced materials or goods and services. I think from the research, I was able to discover that, okay, our locally produced goods and services were rejected in many countries. Why? Because we failed to meet the standards, international standard required for importation of our locally produced uh, goods. For example, in 2000, between 2003 and 2007, there are over 103 different products produced locally in Nigeria, which attempt was were made to export them, but immediately they were rejected or returned. So at that much, apart from oil, nothing is imported to UK, as far as UK is concerned. It's only oil. You find the UK's uh, multinational companies, especially in Nigeria, Delta, and other places, but you find nothing that can be imported from Nigeria to, 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 to UK. Then the last uh, but not the least is lack of proper implementation of national development plans in an industrial development policies and strategy. You know, we have plans. If you look at the blueprint of our national development plan, you say, yes, government knows what they are doing or what is doing is nice, is fantastic, impersonate and what I view. But the problem is implementation. There were serious challenge in the implementation of national development plans. From independence to date, we had about five different national de development plans. The first one was uh, between 1962 and 1968. The second one, 1970 to 1974. The third one, 1975 to 1980. The fourth one is uh, 1980 to 1985. And now 
nobody can tell you if we have any, as far as Nigeria is concerned. Even though there was Vision 2020 under Abacha, 2020, 2020, yes, there was something like that. It's just like a, the, 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 the blueprint of Abacha's administration. But immediately after he has gone, nothing again. Okay, so we are done with the factors that led to the collapse of industries in Northern Nigeria. So now we shall look at the impact of the collapse of industries on the society and economy. The impact of collapse of industries in Northern Nigeria, because this is the area of my research, cannot be overemphasized. You shed tears if you, by the time you start interviewing people who lost job, jobs as a result of closure of industries in many places. In Kaduna alone, there were 11 textile industries which were closed down. They were major industries. Each one had over 20,000 capacity. Of, a, of, of, of employment, but they were closed down. I went there, in fact, there are a number of pictures I will show you where the industries were closed. You find the same thing in Kano, you find the same thing in Jos, in Zaria, in Koji, and so many other parts of uh, Northern Nigeria. So the, the, the closure of those industries, has rendered a number had rendered a number of people jobless. I said uh, what I was discussing with one of our friends here, who happened to live in Kaduna for quite some time. I we discussed about uh, Kakuri, the whole Kakura in Kania and other places emerge as a result of industrial activities because of the number of industries. is an is is is, is an, an industrial layout where a number of industries were located or sited. But now if you go there, you won't see anything. They are no longer uh, working. At the beginning, they start collapsing gradually, declining up to the final stage. Some maybe from the interview I conducted, they told me, okay, from the beginning, if the company or the industry had the capacity of 20 laborers, they reduce, they start reducing to 12,000 later, up to the time they have no option. They have no option except to close down the, 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 the factories. Uh, there is a finding which I collaborated there was a crisis which government perceived then as a religious crisis. But from my finding, it wasn't. It was a socio-economical uh, crisis because most of the people who affected or participated in the crisis mostly were the people who lost their job in the industries in Kaduna and other part of Northern Nigeria. Because Kaduna at, at one time was the headquarters of North, uh, Northern Nigeria. So there were inflow of people from other part of Northern Nigeria to Kaduna. So lack of job or the loss of job make a number of people to be uh, jobless. So if you are jobless, there is one proverb which says, an ideal man is a what? Double workshop. So many people find themselves in such. These are some of the example, the, 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 the outcome of the crisis, for example, between 2000 and 2001, uh, by 2002 resident, Describe, okay, because people see it as a religious crisis, which actually wasn't. 
Kaduna has to be divided, the, the capital, the headquarters has to be divided into two. There was a right a red line between the Muslim dominated area and the Christian dominated area. These are some of the examples I was trying to, 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 to give. Okay, then uh, most of the, I try to summarize, most of the affected uh, areas or industries were well, food and beverages industries, automobile industry, then there were decay in infrastructure facilities, de decrease in the revenue generation, then there were also, uh, it is also affected media, printing, publishing, and construction company. This table is a uh, number of industries collapsed in Kaduna State. For example, between 1999 and 2010, we have 11 textile industries completely shut down. We have manufacturing industries, 192. Automobile like PAN and what have you, we have two of them. Media, printing and publishing company, 25. Health and pharmaceutical, uh, health and pharmaceutical industries, five. Mining, four. Agriculture and food processing, 137. Oil and petrochemical, eight. And petrochemical, I'm talking about uh, fertilizer company. There was a huge fertilizer company in Kaduna, which also affected by, by, by the policy and other factors. Uh, this is one of the tech uh, industries collapse. This is an textile industries in industry located uh, in Kaduna, Kakuri. Uh, around there, there are eleven of them: United Nigerian Textile, Zampara Textile, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is my conclusion. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Yeah. We now welcome our discussant uh, to the... Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, thank you so much. Uh, now our discussant, we're very pleased to welcome here uh, Dr. Uh, Amisu Saliu is completed his PhD at SOAS. Uh, so he's like one of us, <laughs> but at the same time is also originally from the same region as our speaker. So it's, it's a nice coincidence. Uh, and they are both uh, experts on, um, on this topic of economic development in Nigeria. So please, uh, Amis, to join us uh, here uh, on the stage, uh, on the table. Uh, and now uh, Hamisu is going to take over uh, the discussion. Uh, so he's going to comment on, uh, on the paper presented. Uh, and then uh, we will take some question from the audience. Uh, as well as from our online audience. Uh, there are uh, people online um, and there are some question, uh, a couple of questions from here as well. So um, we will do, we will we'll take a question from both. Amiso, over, over to you. Hi, uh, my name is Amis Salim. And I will first and foremost begin by giving us a summary of uh, what the, the paper presenter is going to bring. Uh, the paper presenter look at this work in the cities in Nigeria, especially in northern Nigeria, which actually started in the Ecuadorian period in the 1950s. Uh, as a result of the oil boom of, uh, or the commodity boom of the 1950s, the northern regional government in particular had a lot of surplus waste from the sale of agricultural commodities. And as a result of the amassing of that surplus waste, they entered into partnership with a lot of uh, technical foreign uh, partners to establish or found uh, some industries, especially in the 1980s. And the, most of these industries include uh, the textile, the cement, and the iron and steel industries we have in Nigeria. So the industries actually kept on growing from 1950s through 60s and 70s. And the number of factors that uh, discussed by the paper presenter contributed to the growth of the industries. But the, ones, the fundamental of those uh, factors is sorry, the oil boom of 1970s. 
1973 and 1979, there were two oil booms. And those oil booms led to the inflow of petrol uh, dollars to the purpose of the uh, Nigerian government. And that led to the award of a number of subsidies to industries by the government. And those subsidies have the dual impact of uh, helping to boost the growth of these industries on the one hand. And on another hand, they also have the negative impact of you know the fact that they were not tied in any condition. They were more or less given to political crowds. And those political crowds did not have any compulsion to move towards the attainment of productivity and competitiveness in the industry. Which actually, I argue, led to the collapse of the industries when the structural adjustment programs was uh, implemented in the 1986. Because if those textile industries had developed productivity and competitiveness in the 60s and 70s, when they were receiving lavish government support in terms of subsidies, they would definitely would have competed when the structural adjustment programs was introduced in 1986. But because they were not able to do that, when the economy was opened up, you realize that they couldn't favorably compete with the imported for uh, textile uh, uh, finished products that were imported especially from Asia as it was possible. And the, you also looked at uh, the causes of the Collapse as uh, you look at the infrastructure as one of the causes of the collapse. Yes, infrastructure is one of the problems that led to the collapse of industries in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And the, then you also consider the, the impact of the collapse of the industry in Nigeria, which is, of course, there for everyone uh, to see. And I would particularly want to talk on the impact of uh, the indigenization of the which. I don't know if you have mentioned that. I didn't mention that. Uh, in the Nigerian Enterprises Promotion Decree was uh, introduced in Nigeria in the 1970s. Also. And what the decree basically was about was that uh, certain industries have to be left at the heart, or certain chairs in some industries, key industries, have to be left for Nigerians to participate in. Which means that uh, if like a foreign guy has a company in Kaduna, he will have to forego a part of the shares of those companies to indigenous Nigerians. And as a result of that, we witness massive exodus of uh, a number of industrialists out of Nigeria. Because it simply doesn't look right for an investor who has like, invested heavily in an industry to share a part of the, a substantial portion of his shares to these indigenous Nigerians who might not have the technological capabilities to oversee the running of these uh, industries. So that uh, departure of a uh, huge portion of entrepreneurs who had the skills and the capabilities to run profitable businesses in those industries left a huge vacuum that Nigerians, especially uh, the traditional and former military generals who had some control issues in some of this industry, could not fill. And that also is a factor that I had wished you had also emphasized on as a, as a, as a cause of the collapse yeah. of, of the industry. And for, rest of, for the cement industry, I would have loved also you discuss about. Uh, the impact of the cement armada of 1974, which basically was a scandal where the military government at that particular point in time awarded the importation of about 16 million metric ton of cement into Nigeria, even when the capacity of the local parts in Nigeria was just 1 million uh, metric ton of cement in that particular time because of corruption, of course, and the need for them to, you know, open up opportunities for primitive accumulation for, to yeah. keep, for sustain their regime in power. And the, finally, you discuss about the impact of the collapse of the industry, which is, of course, uh, uh, which is uh, mostly to do with the uh, issue of insecurity in Nigeria. In a paper I wrote in 2015, I actually traced the causes of Boko Haram to 
socioeconomic factors of poverty, illiteracy, unemployment in northern Nigeria. The paper is entitled, Is Boko Haram a Child of Economic Circumstances? So in that paper, I actually make the case that far from what many observers may make of Boko Haram, yes, it has some religious inspiration and motivation, but there are certain factors such as the high prevalence of poverty in the northern Nigeria and high prevalence of unemployment resulting from the collapse of these industries we talk about. Because in the 1980s, at the peak of the textile industry, it employed over 250,000 direct workers. And the, by the end of 2010, all of those industries in Kaduna, Kano, and Zaria collapsed completely. So you can imagine what the impact will be for the families and for social cohesion and what have you. So that is it, I think. And we may now begin to open the floor for some questions. Okay. Yes. A rather simple question. Which is, to what extent is the fact that Kaduna really has no basis in local society? Kaduna North isn't really a northern area structure. There are people like Martin Brook or the rest who are there, but they didn't provide the economic stability. And Kaduna South can, through it, almost the entire labor population were migrants from the middle belt who sent their wages back home. It was a very strange world. And the thesis done on Kaduna South emphasized what a transient world Kaduna South was. So my argument would be that whereas had it been in, say, Kano, the industrial base might have been supported by the Dangothis, the Kano Trading Company, all that sort of world, which has survived much more strongly than it did. Whereas in Kaduna, apart from between the railway junctions and the military barracks, <laughs> what was going for it? What was the whole social structure that might have supported and sustained the Because Kaduna South was a very strange world, uh, admittedly a very fervent history. <laughs> world, but it was not sort of anchored in the roots of the, the northern commercial mercantile sea. There are no hanging in the Duma. <laughs> okay. Uh, can, can I respond? Oh, we are taking more questions. Okay. Uh, you are Kaduna man, or oh, oh, yeah, to say the least, the least. As you are fully aware, Kaduna is initially, or was initially administrative capital of Northern Nigeria. So historically, you cannot compare Kaduna and Kano. I'm talking about the composition the Kaduna, the city, the Kaduna, because being the administrative capital, people from all other parts of Nigeria came there and settled and do their businesses. And they settled for as long as they were in power. As soon as they lost power, they were gone. They it's a transient city. Yes, I'm going to. Well, it all depends. If you're talking about the movers and shakers, that's what we call them, Kaduna Mafia. Those who hold political appointments, who uh, hold political offices, who are thinking rich, 
they leave their villages, their towns and what have you, and come to settle in Kaduna. But we are talking about two different categories of people. Those who are mainly laborers who were in Kaduna for economic activity, work in the industries to earn a living and to send back to their family. And we have another set of people who are elites, elites from Northern Nigeria. Anybody from Northern Nigeria who is rich or who happened to hold a political office or hold a government uh, official or happens to be one of the top government officials must have a house in Kaduna. Even in Kaduna, in a choice location, in Malali, Angwarimi, and some other part of Kaduna. And they are there just to enjoy the, the, the money, their money. When the money finishes, then they go back to their locality and live with their locality. Then in, in case of Kanu, we talk about Angwati. Even in Kanu, Angwati made no attempts to assist people to, uh, to, to salvage their industries in Kano because he's part and parcel of the rest. In fact, there is a way in which you can say Angwati has contributed tremendously to the collapse of industries in Northern Nigeria. In fact, the people of Northern Nigeria, even though is their son, is part of them, but they are accusing him of contributing in the collapse of industries in Northern Nigeria. Virtually now, all the businesses owned by, uh, uh, I mean, all the businesses, most of the business is owned by Angwate. For example, the cement. Angwate bought the Boko in Binue. You know Binue the anywhere side. Cement company. He bought the other one in uh, uh, Kodi. He, in fact, all the, all the cement companies we have in Nigeria are owned by Angwati, except that of uh, Sokwato Bua, owned by uh, Abdul Samad Karaguri. Then look at sugar, look at rice, look at virtually, in fact, Sungul handedly, the federal government under Buhari picked Angwati and gave him a contract of billions naira to build or to construct a uh, refinery in Lagos. So Angwati, there is a way in which we can say he has contributed immensely in the collapse of industries in Northern Nigeria. Angwati has no any industry in Northern Nigeria, except that, that of Koji. What do you call the, uh, no, uh, in Koji, Obadia. That is the only cement company he has in Northern Nigeria. But he made Northern Nigeria a consumer, a market, because of our population. So he go to Lagos, he go to Abeokuta, Ibada, and what are you, produces everything, then send it back to Northern part. And most of the materials, I mean raw materials used in the production were produced in the Northern part of the country and take, took it to Southern part. Is it scientific? Is it logical? Why can't you come to Northern state, establish the same industries, since they are availability of raw material and make good use of them. Am I what's your answer to why he doesn't set up all the industries in Kaduna? Because the labor supply isn't actually based there. Is that the answer? I mean, you know, thank you. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Kaduna is, a, we call it colonial city. And it's emerge as a result of railway activity, which a number of laborers in floods or came to settle there. It's quite happy. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. If I may chip in here, please. Uh, I think also the issue of like the quality of uh, the employees and not between the south and the north is also a factor because down south you have formally educated, highly formal, uh, high skilled workers, whereas in most of the nodes, you have like semi-skilled and unskilled workers. 
and also the issue of security, which we have just talked about, is one of the reasons investors look, it's one of the point things investors look at before they sort of invest in us. It is obvious to everyone. So, and the, the relatively affluent southern part of the country is, of course, uh, more peaceful than relatively than the northern part of the country. <laughs> If you think of the sort of dire picture of uh, the Nigerian economy and the coast, but northern Nigeria specifically, but, but some, some of you are going to extend to the country as a whole. And I, I sort of wonder, I mean, you know, uh, I, Nigeria still, if, the, if one goes by the official statistics, it still has the largest GDP on that continent, claims to have. Um, the rates of growth over the past several years have not been substantial. So I just kind of wonder, it's a question of ignorance, is where, where does all this come from? <laughs> is it all coming from the South? Uh, or if, if, if the collapse is as dire as you suggest, where does the growth come from? And where does the GDP come from? But that's the way I think. Yes, sir. Uh, even me, I used to wonder when maybe the government official were giving statistics that Nigeria, and South Africa are the or are the major economies in in Africa. I I put question mark. South Africa, yes, I can agree because I was in South Africa for good three four years. I know what is economy is all about. The industry there, they they are perfectly working employing millions of people there. In fact, in South Africa, not, every, not all the South Africans can take any job. They have options. Most of the small, small, petty, petty jobs and what I do are then taken by people who came from Nigeria, uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and, and so on and so forth. In the course of my research, I went to so many places like Richards Bay, there was an industrial layout. I was there in Johannesburg, in Durban, and other parts of it. But in Nigeria, you cannot find anything commensurable to that of uh, South Africa. And even the power, even though South Africa began to have a problem with the energy problem, but not as that of Nigeria. Uh, throughout my stay in South Africa during my program, I can I can't remember a day or a second when there was no light throughout. But in Nigeria, it's easier to go and find the whole locality without light for five years, not even five days, five months, or something. five years. I can remember. When I was serving, we have what they call NYC, yeah. it's a national service, mandatory. I sat in one village in Bauchi. Throughout my stay there, there was no light. So uh, I think if you are talking about population and consumer society, Nigeria is number one. But if you are talking about major economies in Africa, South Africa, there is no two way about it. Yeah. yeah, but in Nigeria, even government is not sincere. There is no uh, sincerity of purpose. They will say this now, tomorrow they will go and do another thing. But in South Africa, you can see how government is serious. Whatever they say, they mean it. Whatever they do, they mean it. Look at in, in infrastructure facilities. It's amazing in South Africa. In fact, when I went to South Africa first, I was wondering, am I in Europe or in Africa? Is it Africa because or are Tambo or are Tambo International Airport? I yeah. tried to compare it with that of MM to Motala Mohammed Airport or Dr. Inambi Azuki Airport, Abuja. Oh, Malang Amin Kalu. So South Africa, Nigeria, they just create all these figures and say it. I had yeah. to talk about corruption. Corruption is one of the factors. But when I discussed with Professor Morilas, he said, okay, uh, issue of corruption 
is broad. If we brought it here, it may take the one and a half hour presentation discussing corruption in Nigeria. But I know as far back as 2015 in the uh, rank of corruption, Nigeria was uh, tagged. Uh, tagged was the tag for this. So corruption. <laughs> in, <laughs> so, so corruption, corruption is one of the major problems for Nigerian state. Thank you. So, so the yeah. biggest focus is that, is that yeah, I would actually want to add something on this. Uh, you know, uh, the composition of the GDP in Nigeria is largely, uh, the gross in Nigeria largely goes down to the growth of the service sector. So the service sector is the one that is growing faster than any other sector. So the manufacturing value added in Nigeria is less than 15%, that's what we're talking now. Two, as you will know, the GDP, gross domestic problem, has been called, gross domestic product has been called a gross domestic problem. Mm -hmm. Partly, of course, like it is not a precise, mathematically precise measure of the gross of the GDP. In Nigeria, you have a past informal sector, yeah. which is not captured by the GDP. Yeah. And the, because most of the growth in the GDP, the year in year, year on year growth we are witnessing in the growth of Nigerian GDP is mostly accounted for by what? By the service sector. And most of this service sector is being taken over by highly skilled workers. So the low skilled, low and the semi skilled workers are, not are stuck in the unemployment trap. They are stuck in poverty. And they are stuck of in, in, in most of the problems that Nigeria currently uh, faces. Thank you. Um, there is a question. Yeah, there is one more. Uh, can you come from the room? Yeah. Um, there is a question from someone who is still offered. He says, um, I thank you for the presentation. First of all, very interesting. And he said, What are you suggesting to address this current state of affairs? And he uh, says, should his efforts be led by one or all of one state government to federal government and all civil society in Northern Nigeria? So that's his question. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, the problem associating with industrial collapse in northern Nigeria. Sometimes I used to say only good in, uh, uh, intervention, divine intervention will solve the problem. Because there were several attempts to address the problem, especially by the industrialists who whose in the uh, factories were closed. I could remember when Nama Sambo was a vice president and former Emir of Kano, Sanusi was a CV and central uh, bank governor. Those people, association of industrialists, met them and outlined their problem and how the problem can be addressed. And government said through CBN, uh, billions of Naira were released. Because I remember I, I interviewed one of the industrialists in Kano, uh, the teacher at the Hammer. I know you know him, uh, the teacher at the Hammer. He said, all we have been hearing over the media about the government intervention and what I knew was not true. And later, what I discovered or what I uh, realized, for industries to survive, to flourish in Nigeria, they need a conducive atmosphere, working atmosphere. The policies, policies of government has to be revisited because the policies are no longer favorable for industrial survival in Nigeria. Government and there are a lot of inconsistencies in the policy making of government. 
I've been hearing some governors saying, okay, they have attracted a number of foreign investors. They will be, I said, they are just deceiving electoral, the, the masses there. No foreign investor will come to your locality or to your state and invest a huge amount of money in the name of business. When you, you cannot even guarantee the lives of, 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 of the citizens, hopeless of other people who come and establish. I think, uh, Angelica, not quite long, I sent you some of the releases from my university about security, kidnapping, yes, yes, yes. and what I do, yeah. that people should be more careful about. But actually, the security agencies, the government are not ready to address all this problem. That's what amounted to what the current problem we have been facing in Nigeria. You cannot ask anybody to come and establish a business in a particular location where you cannot guarantee the security of his life, regardless of his property mm. or what he's investing there. So number one, security. When the adequate security is provided, then followed by energy, power supply, is central, is important. And no nation, no society could have developed without industries. Is then industrialization make life of society to be brighter and better off. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say a word on this also. Uh, because the question is all about uh, the solutions. Yeah. Uh, it is clear that uh, Nigeria has almost, we can say, putting it right with the cement industry. Mm -hmm. The major industries now that we are struggling textile. to get right are the textile and maybe yeah. the iron and steel industries and other food and beverage industries. So now the question is, if Nigeria can get it right with the cement, why not with the textile and the other industries? Now, to answer this question, we of course need to look at what has been done in the cement industry. So as to see the possibility of replicating what has been doing here in the other industries. Now, what has actually been done in the cement industry is that during the regime of former President Olusha Obasanjo, he called over Tangote for a meeting and asked him, why is it that in spite of the fact that we are well endowed with, with limestone, which is the major ingredient for making cement, we keep on importing more than 70% of our cement for our domestic needs. Now, what Tangote told him was that uh, it is because it is cheaper to import in bulk, repackage it into PPKT bags and sell it than it is to produce locally. So now what did Obasan do to them? He came up with the so-called backward integration policy for people like Angote and ostensibly other investor, investors to see the possibility of investing in the local cement industry so that it impedes the government will gradually stop the importation of the cement industry. And Tangote quickly moved in by investing heavily, buying over these Kamatos cement industries, investing in them, collaborating with China and other advanced countries to set up this industry, start producing. And one of the policies Obasanjo was smart enough to use was that, okay, because importing and selling cement in Nigeria is a profitable business, and you need to be well connected with the powers that you need to get the import to import the, the import license to import cement in Nigeria. So now, the, even the importation of cement was made conditional to commitment to invest in local cement production. And as a result of that, the number of people who are looking for import licenses or licenses to import cement was, was limited because not everyone had the resources to. To, to, to invest or was even willing to invest in local cement production. But people like Dangote, one, because of the commitment of the government, which he, which he signaled through the introduction of this policy, moved in and heavily invested in these uh, Kamatos industries. And at the end of the day, the government pays out now the importation. Okay, now that the companies you, Dangote, have bought and invested in have come of age to satisfy local cement uh, demand. Now, 
we completely ban the importation of cement. But you we, you could argue that uh, this has its own downside in the sense that you know Nigerian cement consumers buy cement at exorbitant prices. But still, the argument put forward by Angwati and the Obasanjo and even subsequent government is that they helped in at least reviving the cement industry to meet local demand, which was largely met by import before the introduction of the policies. And the, the way the policy works nowadays is that there has to be a synergy between the business community and the the government. Now, what was the sort of synergy between Tangwate and the Obasanjo at the time was that Tangwate is, of course, known to be a major financier of the ruling PDP then, and even to an extent, the ruling ABC. So, people always find uh, the business community always have to have that avenue through which they can reach out to the ruling coalitions in power, a way of, of course, sponsoring their, their campaigns and what have you. In return for favorable policies in the industry of the cooperation, which is actually what happened in the cement industry. And we finally got it right, at least in the sense of our ability to meet domestic cement demand now, and our ability to create some employment also for about 30,000 uh, workers in the cement industry, and also our ability to save some foreign exchange that hitherto went to cement importation. So in terms of the solution, I would argue, especially for the other sectors that we are now struggling to revive, we need to adopt this model into the uh, textile industry and to an extent even the uh, iron and steel industries and other industries could have leverage that uh, that Salu uh, will save their colors. And to do this would of course require a sophisticated movement. I will particularly talk on the textile industry, like the current governments are Cotton textile and garment policy, like attempt to overhaul the entire industry in all it is value chains, from the cotton growing uh, subsector to the textile manufacturing to the garment made. This obviously is too much for the government to handle. So instead of the government, especially in, or, or to focus on all the subsectors of these industries, it is better we go at it sequentially. Let us get maybe the cotton production right first if we want to specialize in cotton production. Because the reality is that no country, not even China, like specializes in all the value chains nowadays. You have uh, countries like Bangladesh that only specializing in garment production, and you have India specializing in, in garment and to an extent also in cotton production. So let us focus if we want to make uh, such of uh, like the textile industry. Let us say our textile industries can continue to import cotton from outside and manufacture the textile material we need, rather than to force them to be sourcing their cotton from within. When we know we have problem with the, the, with the, with, with the agriculture or in terms of the production of cotton nowadays. So these are sequential and strategic policies that I think could be adopted to revive most of these uh, industries. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I was uh, I was just wondering, um, you know, this complex way of, uh, I mean, you try to trace you know, the, the the history of uh, industrial collapse, you know. and then uh, you 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 I mean, you raised quite a number of you you found quite a number of cases. I'm just wondering the 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 understanding in the north. And in the south, uh, for instance, talking about Dangote investing in the south, as at, at what time, uh, if you if you want to, uh, um, you know, apportion blame Dangote to you, at what at what point in time, the Dangote's uh, involvement in the industry you know, affected the collapse of Industry. One, two. The issue of uh, urbanization. Of any, I mean, urbanization. Yes. Could that be one of the reasons that we're not up on? Because when the oil boom came, people's consum consumption tastes changed. 
I mean, people could not afford as I mean, people could not afford to live better life. So, I mean, all of these uh, are there the, the, the untold stories about the collapse of the industries uh, in modern Nigeria. And more recently, the issue of security. Dangote moved his business out of the north purely and mainly on security reasons. Because the South we all know is relatively peaceful. So, and again, the issue of education. Mainly. So I, I'm wondering if uh, beyond the uh, inactive power supply, there are other unvoiced you know, uh, reasons that uh, we know. Uh, and then I don't want to bring the issue of EDG, but you know it's a big deal in our space. All of these uh, may be quiet, I mean, and told stories about something that's not about affected the collapse. So, well, it's based on just raising the fact of what Your question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of related. I'm, I'm just bringing in another thread, which is the environmental question as well. Um, I mean, we talked about the structural justice program, and just from my own very basic research, I found out a lot about the environmental impact of monocropping um, that was introduced, um, deforestation as well, and the expansion of the Sahel, and how that's impacting and pushing the current grazing prices as well, um, because Hydrogen are looking for fresh foliage. So, from that whole kettle of fish, it's also sort of contributing again and as a consequence of, of the collapse of industry. Um, but, how can we, or how can manufacturers or industrialists sort of also not just care about the revival of industry? In terms of in, from an economic point of view, but also account for the environmental impact. Because although the cement industry may have gotten it right in terms of providing employment and meeting domestic needs, it's still an incredibly extractive industry that has major environmental consequences. And it's the working class that are really feeling a lot of that. So I don't know. Again, it's just another layer to add to the religion, to add to the security question. Yeah, we could talk about this. This question is very interesting. I mean, even the floods as well, recently, that were related to the dam and uh, the loss of arable land, it's all just to meet the environment. Not to bring in the sort of warrior a question <laughs> again, but it's it's a real pressing issue, and it, the two have to go hand in hand: economic development and environment, ecological sort of fortification. Yeah. Thank you. I think you are right, but uh, we all know that uh, contrapreneurs or industrialists and environmentalists are strange to get followers. One is after profit, and the other is after giving the environment feeling. And it is always hard, even in developed countries like this, to keep the right balance. And the, that is where we see a number of uh, entrepreneurs or big companies and corporations sponsor research on environment, environment that uh, end up like uh, mirroring like what they want as an uh, output of those uh, researches. But in developing countries, to be honest, uh, we do struggle with issues of environmental disasters as a result of most of these uh, industrializations of country, advanced countries. And even the industrializations, we are beginning to find our footing in. And the policymakers are at a loss often as to should the goal be the creation of jobs, employment, and conservation of foreign exchange at the expense of what? At the expense of the environment. So it is always difficult to draw that line of balance. You know, everyone should be concerned about the environment, but uh, 
where do you draw the right line with the scholars very tough not to drag for the policy makers? And I think that it depends on the government and the kind of policy makers. Because to be honest with you, if we care, we say we should care about the environment, we would practically do not spend force in the system. Surely it's not the bad condition, drought environment. Yeah, they are, they are, they are, they are. I agree with you. <clears throat> but uh, I, what, all I'm saying is it is a tough persons and decisions to make for all seniors. Because for entrepreneurs like Amwati and what I do, profit comes first. Mm -hmm. Then whatever we will talk about, like the environment and what I do comes up. Mm -hmm. And for the government also it needs to make revenues. And uh, unfortunately for governments in developing countries, the sources of their revenue because of the fact that we have few formal and big corporations that as like uh, compared to developed countries, we have to an extent rely on these uh, entrepreneurs who operate in an environmentally unfriendly manner in order to secure some of our, our revenues to sustain our government and to sustain our economy. So what I'm saying, I care for the environment and the policy makers in developing countries also care about the environment, but there's always that difficulty of drawing the right lines of where do we stop in our industrial drive? Do we stop where the issue of uh, uh, environment begins and at what cost to the economy and to the environment? Um, yes, I think we got another couple, maybe Derek, were you asking something earlier? No, okay. Um, yes, can I just make one little comment before passing on to our um, colleague here? Uh, yeah, no, I think I I agree with the uh, in the in the sense of like this idea of the environment is becoming almost like a, a slogan, like a tick in a box. Like we all have to be concerned about the environment, but actually look at the UK. I mean, what kind of progress are they actually making? Rich nation where they are the cause of the environmental crisis, they are still investing in fossil fuel. So how can you expect countries in developing world where they actually bearing the the bigger price, but they have the least capability to actually make the change? into this situation we're in uh, as, a, as a whole. So sometimes I, I understand, um, yeah, it's quite refreshing to hear from you because exactly, it's like sometimes you feel like you don't wanna, it's not that you're against the environmental issues. Of course, we all are supporting. We all know we are burning in this planet, but how do you actually, you know, in the real sense tackle it? Because I feel even here we are stuck with the government that is not investing in, in, envir in the environment as it should with the sort of finances they actually have. Sorry, there was a little that comment for me. And now uh, I pass it on. Yeah, you have one more question. We don't have any more questions from the uh, audience. So I leave it another, yeah. If you want to uh, conclude with some comment and question. Yeah. Maybe a bit of a naive question, but what would it take to invest in, for example, wind power and things that would, once the, the energy is there, then the industry would follow? Yeah. In, instead of like, what would it take to invest in environmentally friendly power production, and then what would follow that? So what would it what would it take to get Nigeria to do that? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's basic. <laughs> I think one. That is the question of capital <laughs> because the fact is uh, most of these uh, environment friendly sources of energy. They are very costly, uh, which is why even developed countries are now in the embryonic stage of their implementation. And if they are very costly, it means, of course, producing goods and services, banking on these sources of energy, cleaner sources of energy. At the end of the day, we are going to produce goods and services at higher uh, cost. And that would mean selling at exorbitant prices, and that would mean limiting your market. And the entrepreneurs are always concerned about minimizing the cost. And the, one, if you take capital, of course, which is lacking in developing countries, most of our entrepreneurs struggle to acquire the capital to invest in this industry. Dangote is just making multi billion dollar of investment in. Is refinery in Lagos, and he is maybe up to his neck in debts, and still the company is 
not functionally. And the, it will also take the will of the government, most of the, it takes some, they, some knowledge to even appreciate what the impact of industrialization is on the environment. And unfortunately, most of our leaders in developing countries even cannot articulate or cannot appreciate this impact because the flooding she was talking about affects the ordinary people who live on the banks of the Niger and the Benue rivers. It doesn't affect the well to do or the highly placed politicians in Nigeria. All they could see is like the effects of the flood or the NTAs, the Nigerian television information. And after one or two weeks of sensationalization by the news media, it has gone. So we need leaders who really appreciate the need to preserve and conserve our environment. And we also need the capital. And above all, we also need the investment in the science and technology of these cleaner energies. And the, most of the investments in education in Nigeria we are still lagging in terms of science, technology, and those areas that we need to be focused on. Otherwise, we have vast arm of wind and sunlight energy to tap from, but the means and the capabilities, technological capabilities to come up with the right equipment for that is lacking. And in that area, we need support from developed countries, industrialized countries. Thank you. So yeah. in addition, uh, it's a young formation. I, I think uh, other source of energy, we have them. And it's not like we don't have the financial capability. What I from this, what I'm saying, I'm saying from the finding, from the research I conducted, interviews, and what I do. Honestly speaking, what uh, make all those things fail is uh, corruption. We have uh, energy commission. It's an agency established primarily for this under Ministry of Science and technology. And the people who headed the agency, I know Professor Sani Samu is a professor in that field. He was a former vice chancellor. He has the know-how of how this renewable energy can be generated. For, but that agency has become a funding pipe where the resources are being siphoned by people in power. But you find out each and every year, a billion of naira are being budgeted for the agency. Then they went out to other countries to solicit or to request for donation, which it has been given to them. But unfortunately, they are not making good use of it. In fact, the, the major disease that is affecting Nigeria is corruption, honestly speaking. And corruption has to do with poor leadership. We don't have leaders. If you'll be elected in, into the office of governor today, tomorrow you become a multi -bilonia. That's just how. It's not possible in other countries, but in Nigeria, it's very much possible. After, people will be hailing you. You are now the most important person in your society. Professor Morilas, you know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are in Italy. Yeah, so corruption is a major problem. Honestly, it's not that we don't have the capacity or capability of using other sources. I could remember when Omar Musairadua was a president, there was an attempt in Casina, that turbine. We call it farm, turbine farm, whereby and hundreds of thousands were destroyed. But by the time he died, that was the end of the project. Thank you. So the comment of, yeah, so I read an article about Amazon Valley University and how they have plans to transition uh, their energy supply to run on agricultural waste. So I was just going to, that's 
basically comes uh, as like a possible precedent implemented. Let's see whether that's implemented. It was announced five years ago. I'm not sure what. But I think that I think we saw from the screen that I mean, it never worked because from my university platform, there was data on that that was just from the screen beneath, you know, just to Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the rest of the is yeah, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody. Just to say that the event is recorded, and therefore, if uh, some of your friends or family had a chance to see it, it's going to be posted online uh, in the next few days. Uh, so, yeah, so that we will keep sharing it. So we will make it today, but we have a good audience here, and then put it online. Thank you so much to the online and then after the week, thank you very much. And uh, just to say, yes, the next week we are in our second uh, elevated spelling here, same on the same place next Monday. Uh, it's going to be on uh, music performance I'm not going to say too much. <laughs> but uh, yes, so thank you so much. Thank you, Amis, as well. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we thank you so much, uh, Sandhu, as well. Fantastic yeah. presentation. Thank you. Thank you.